been to the toilets of creative space. <laughs> That's what it says over the door, toilets and creative space. Okay. So, hello everyone and welcome to this event. It's part of the Being Human Festival, which is the UK's National Festival of the Humanities. Yes! My name's Vivian Parry. I'm going to be your host tonight. I'm a science writer and broadcaster. And here at Modern Art Oxford, we have a small but perfectly formed audience. Thank you so much for coming. But online, hello to all of you. Uh, we've got actually rather more <laughs> than there are here. Uh, but they are joining us from all parts of the British Isles. So welcome to everyone. And today what we're asking is, what do you really want to know about your child's DNA? Now, some of you, and I wonder whether anyone will put up their hands if they've uh, done this, some of you may have already used kits available over the internet to look for ancestry, uh, or to look uh, for answers about medical issues that you might need to look out for in the future, or even just for fun. But the what do you really want to know question is particularly relevant at the moment because last month the Chancellor announced that funds were being provided for a programme run by Genomics England with the NHS which will assess the technology, uh, whole genome sequencing, to screen 100,000 newborn babies. And just to explain that a bit more, so newborn babies are currently screened for nine conditions soon after birth using a spot of blood from what's called a heel prick test. And if you've had a baby, you probably didn't even realise that that was going on. Uh, it's, it happens in the kind of blur immediately after uh, birth. And whole genome sequencing, and it's... If you hear the, uh, the acronym WGS, that's what that means, whole genome uh, uh, sequencing, uh, can extend the number of conditions, perhaps to as many as 500, which means many rarer conditions can be included in screening. The programme is also going to think about how babies' genomes might be used throughout their lives, for instance, if they become ill as adults. But there are a ton of ethical issues to consider, and that's what we're going to be thinking about tonight, through a series of four case studies, uh, which I hasten to run. are not actual cases, but they are drawn from real life. And, oh, that's marvellous. I've only got one page of my script. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I'm now going to do um, is, before we introduce our panel, I'm going to ask you the first of a number of poll questions. So, with a stroke of my magic wand, each of you are now in the second trimester of pregnancy. Uh, applies for all of you online, you're all now pregnant. And you are now going to be asked, or you will shortly be asked, because you're pregnant, uh, and it's, you're going to your next hospital visit, you're going to be asked whether you would like to take part in this programme after your baby is born. What is your initial thought? And yes, no, or don't know. So yes, no, or don't know. Are you answering? Very good. And in a moment, magically, uh, the answers will appear. And 73% say yes, 21% don't know, and no, 8%. Okay. So, um, just to say to our online audience, um, we get the questions live here, but you can also ask questions throughout, and they will magically appear on my iPad, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to introduce our panel first of all. So, on my left, uh, Anna Kalukasen is Director of the Centre for Personalised Medicine here at the University of Oxford, and she's a clinical geneticist at both Southampton and Oxford Genetic Services, and her research focuses on the ethical and legal aspects of developments in genetics and genomics. Mike Parker 
is the Professor of Bioethics at the University of Oxford. He's Director of the Wellcome Centre for Ethics and Humanities and Director of the Ethox Centre at Oxford. And finally, uh, Sarah Wynne is Chief Executive of Unique, an organisation dedicated to supporting uh, those with it, living with rare chromosome and gene disorders. And just to declare our interests here, I have a part-time role as Head of Public Engagement at Genomics England, which is introducing this programme. Mike Parker is on Genomics England board and is chair of its Ethics Advisory Committee. Annika Lucasen is a member of the group of stakeholders advising Genomics England about this programme, which is a hybrid project, which is, so it's both a research programme and it's a clinical service. So it will feed back real results. And you also had an interest to declare because you've just been appointed to the panel that's going to look at which conditions should be yeah. included. So let's start by asking each of you where you think the main ethical issues are. So just very briefly, Annika. So I think to go with the title of the talk, Familial Fortunes, I think we need to think about what screening in newborn children says about other family members and what we need to do with those results. I think we need to think about what we do with the results over the next 10, 20, 30 years, because if the aim is just to find more diseases, then we're also going to find a lot of information about more adult onset conditions. And I think, lastly, we need to ask ourselves, is this the right way to go about it? Because given that in this room, we all have 99.9% .9 the same genetic code, do we really need to sequence that 99.9% .9 to find these um, 200, 300, 500 conditions? Mike. I think, that are, well, as we'll hear, I guess, this evening, there'll be a long list. There's a long list of ethical issues, so just picking a couple. I mean, I think one that may, may not come up, um, but worth mentioning, is about resource allocation. So there are a whole load of things we could do with our NHS budget. Um, and there's a question about what we should spend our money on. And, you know, I'm not saying that this isn't something we should spend money on, but it's, it's a question, you know, whether, how high a priority this should be, and all of the technology and the sort of questions that Annika mentioned earlier. I think there are questions about what people want, so I think there's a kind of there's a question here about about what kind of NHS we want and what kind of health service we want. I don't think this is necessarily a decision for experts. I mean, alone, of course, there's a need for experts, but I think there's a, got to be a conversation about what kind of society we want, and this is an important part of that. And I also think, also think there are big questions which are kind of related to this, but sort of slightly off the side, which are to do with the relationship between research and clinical practice in our NHS and how we think about how we think about that relationship, to what extent do we want an NHS that is, in addition to being kind of equal and uh, free at the point of care, uh, excellent. And, what, how, and what, does it be, what does excellent care mean in relation to how we think about the uses of our data and that sort of thing? So we've, also, we've already got about nine hours of uh, <laughs> debate here. Sarah? Yes, and I agree. I think there are lots of big questions, but I think um, the big one, which relates to what both Annika and Mike said, is really what do we want to know? So I think it looks from the poll that everybody, or the majority have said, yes, they want to know this. But I think that actually we all need to think about it, not just the experts, but the public and the patients and everyone about really what do we want to know? Do we actually want to know this? And I think this debate today is going to hopefully tease out whether we really do want to know this. And the right also not to know things is also something that I think we need to think about. OK, so let's outline the first case study. John and Sally were told that their newborn son will be affected by Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Now that's a condition that affects mainly boys and results in progressive muscle degeneration and weakness. He's likely to die in his 20s. But these predictions are only approximate because onset and progression of symptoms varies considerably between individuals. They've been told that he'll begin showing symptoms around the time he starts walking. He seems perfectly normal now. John and Sally regret signing up because now they have the result, they can't unknow it. Sally in particular wishes she hadn't been told so that she could have had more time with him as a normal baby. She says, I thought knowledge about his genetic makeup would give me more power but in fact, I feel powerless. 
So for our audience, both online and here uh, at the uh, museum in Oxford, would you want to know or not? Would you want to know or not? Yes, no, or don't know. And the important thing is that you can't do anything about it once you know. There's no yes, treatment. Yes, there's no current treatment, but there might be treatments in the, in future. the future. Yeah. Okay. So a very large number of you would, would want to know. So I'm going to go to you first, Sarah, on this. Because uh, uh, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I think it's quite interesting, actually, that people still do want to know. because, And I guess that comes down to the, what is information for. Mm -hmm. And I think we think often, and the current newborn screening practice is all about testing for conditions that are treatable and you can do something about but actually what this is telling us is that even when we don't have a treatment people still want to know and information is you know people like to be equipped with information it makes them feel that they have some power but unlike just, unlike sally who yes. said she felt powerless but it's not just information is it it's also support yeah because what you want to do is once you know you want to talk to other parents yeah. who've been uh, who have a, a child with a similar with a problem sibling. To be find prepared. Out, yes, to be prepared. Yeah, and, I, and of course that's what we do at Unique is we offer a lot of support for lots of families who don't necessarily have a treatment for their child's condition. And yet being able to identify a group that are going on the same journey as you is really important for families. So I think, you know, and the audience seem like they agree that there is some, there's some benefit to that information even without a treatment. Annika, what are your thoughts about this? Yeah, and I, I completely agree with Sarah that um, the, the sort of wanting, if it's out there to be known, then why would you not want to know it to get as much support as you possibly can? So I think that's a really interesting question, isn't it, about newborn screening? Because uh, as Sarah says, so far we've designed it so that we would only pick up conditions where you could do something about them, where you could... Um, where you've got good evidence that a treatment or an intervention would alter the course of the disease. But it sounds like people feel the same um, even without that. I suppose my question is, what do people think if this was even later onset? What if this was onset in your 20s, 30s or 40s? Does that change things? Mm. Should we know that at birth? Now, interestingly, Genomics Indian did a public dialogue and the feeling that came back was that people wanted to know about conditions uh, not that appeared in later life, mm. so they didn't want to know about late onset conditions. Um, so an example might be um, the BRCA gene and or a bowel cancer gene uh, for familial bowel cancer. But what they did want to know about was things that could be um, in some ways mitigated, reduced or prevented altogether, um, although that's quite unusual. But that's what they wanted, things that they could do something about. So before, and, and it seemed that if it was something that they could, uh, what, there was a window of opportunity, because at the moment a lot of those conditions are identified when symptoms have become irreversible. And people wanted things identified perhaps before they became irreversible in the hope that they could delay or prevent them in some way. When they were actionable. When they were actionable, yeah, exactly. Um, Mike, what are your thoughts? Um, I think there are a couple of things really that come to mind. So one is this, the way in which it's quite common in medical ethics to use, for example, the idea of, reg of regret or, the, or the, the opposite, which is they'd thank you later, um, you know, as, as ways of judging whether something's right or wrong. So, you know, for example, com imposing treatment on someone who doesn't want it on the basis that, well, they'll thank you later, you know, is, is, is one way in which people think that's one way. Is it ethical or isn't it? So forced feeding, for example, with someone who has anorexia, what, what would the future person think about this? And in this case, the idea that, of regret being a way of judging whether the decision should have been offered in the first place. So I think there's a whole interesting kind of conversation about that. But I don't think, I don't think it works in this case. So I don't, because, some, because a particular couple regret or a particular person regrets a choice doesn't mean it was wrong to have offered that choice. Mm. And it doesn't necessarily mean they were wrong to have made the choice in the first place. Mm. So I think... So I think that's a bit of, a, it's a red herring, but it's a really interesting kind of red okay. herring. So but the other thing, just one thing mm. I think is that 
if you don't, if 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 you don't, uh, one of the advantages of diagnosing conditions or identifying conditions where where there aren't treatments or where the, perhaps in some cases where there's no diagnosis as a kind of something's wrong, is that you know you get then get patient groups that will lobby for change and will lobby for lobby for development, you know, because because there's a, then it creates a need for further knowledge. So there are sometimes advantages to identifying things that are still uncertain or untreatable, I think. Okay, what do you think? I'm looking at them. You've all gone quiet. I'm sure you all have opinions. You with the lovely green T-shirt, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, by the way, I pick on people. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with the sort of general public sentiment that I would not want to know conditions later in life, but that I would want to know conditions that happen very early. Um, not entirely sure in my own head why that is. I guess you don't want it hanging over you as a cloud for a long time. Um, yeah, so I kind of agree with that. But, but also in that, is there something about uh, a child, they want to make their own decisions about whether to know or not? So if it's a late onset condition, is it for them to know? Because uh, otherwise you've taken the decision for them. Yeah. Sorry, I'm a pi I'm, I've really no, picked on him just now. <laughs> You're doing so well. I guess we make decisions for our children all the time and the, that they can't make that decision. Um, but I guess when it's knowledge that applies to a point where they can make the decision about the knowledge, um, then maybe it becomes their decision, I guess. Okay. Um, someone with a hand up. Oh, somebody with a hand up. Yes. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, taking away their sort of their right to an open future and, and that sort of thing. But what about the decisions that the parents might want to make? They may may want to make different reproductive decisions for future children. Yeah, that's a that's a point. Uh, uh, particularly if it's a if it's something that's that's very uh, that shortens lifespan dramatically, for instance. Well, and if it's something that's inherited, so here the mother may well be a carrier, so it may be relevant not only for her future children, but for her siblings and their children, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So it is very much about familial fortunes. Isn't it? Mm. And remember that if you're online, you can also submit questions here. So please do, um, if you've got any. I know when I will get them on my magic machine here. Um, <laughs> one of the dangers, one of the difficult things in situations like this, where you've got, for example, a range of views, is that it's quite tempting to say, well, most people would want this, well. or most people wouldn't want this. But of course, what really matters in medicine is is there anyone who would want this? So, you know, if you've got if you've got a particular, I mean, obviously that you, then the resource question: Do you set up a whole set health service just because one person wants? It? Obviously not. But so you, this might be a good basis for designing a service. But ultimately, just because you know, eighty percent of people would want something doesn't mean you, you you know you have to you have to tailor your care to the individual person's values and needs. Now, other choice, and I was thinking about John and Sally. I wonder whether they knew the decision they were making before they made it. Like, it's about making sure people are informed before they have to make a decision. But being informed doesn't mean that you've really understood <coughs> what it might mean. Because often you say things, oh, yes, I'll do that. And then you think, oh, my God. I wish I hadn't. I wish I hadn't. Or I didn't really think about it that hard. Mm. I didn't understand the decision I was making. Yeah. Sorry. Um, sorry, this is possibly a bit off topic, but so far we've talked a lot about sort of it in quite a binary fashion. Do you get the genome sort of sequenced and find out what's there, or do you not? But could it also be possible for a, a third option where the genome of the child is sequenced and that's stored in some medical database, however the parents don't find out? And as sort of we're talking about... Um, personalised medicine here, could that also be a possible use case of this technology where the doctors know what conditions Ooh, they you see. Ooh. bear it in mind even without the parents? So, so now there's a conundrum, isn't it? Uh, because um, if doctors know, would you be happy that your doctor knew something really important about your family that you didn't know? Um, I think I'd most doctors would feel very uncomfortable. Yes, about I'd, that. I'd suggest a lot of people would feel very uncomfortable about that. But you're right, it could be for the late onset conditions. So you prevent the parents from seeing the late onset conditions. But of course, anything that could be dealt with in childhood that was really important to deal with in childhood, then you could 
then you could do that. So good thought. Well, that's that's old age. I don't feel, I don't, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I don't feel completely uncomfortable with the idea that the health system has a resource that might be called upon at various points in my life that I don't necessarily know about. You know, that there's, there's data, there's information there. That no, I think that's right. So I think if it's there and not analysed, that's yes, one they're thing. Yes, not analysed. But if, rather if than I was your health professional and I knew that you were about to get Alzheimer's, you might feel uncomfortable, or I would feel uncomfortable knowing that about you and not telling yes. you about it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but, but I, that's the question, isn't it? Would it be analysed or would it be available? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. But, but I'm not against the idea. It of also it. suggests, from what you were saying, that mm. you can divide your gene up, up into bits that are relevant in childhood and bits that are relevant in adulthood. And it's not as clear cut as that. So I think it would be really hard to keep to store your genome and say, well, you can access that bit, but you can't access that bit. And I think that would, to tie, to tie that into data protection regulation would also be... Uh, very difficult. So it sounds easy, but I think in practice it might be hard to do. So uh, we've got some questions here from the online audience. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you're not asleep there at home. Um, so um, uh, so yeah, we, we go know. on. Uh, uh, somebody it. here saying they agree regarding the informed consent. Many argue that there's no such thing as fully informed consent. Can we really prepare parents for everything? Nope. Well, I was shocked when I had a baby. <laughs> I knew what was coming, but oh my God, nothing prepared me. And well, I've written a whole lot of books about pregnancy as well. I think that's really interesting, isn't it? Because fully informed consent, well, yes, of course we can give fully informed consent about certain things, but about things that are really open-ended and we don't, and there are so many different possibilities, it's, it's much harder. And just to go back to what you said earlier, Viv, about heel prick test, you know, sort of passing in a bit of a blur, and not, not many people remembering that when they had their child, they had a heel prick test, or remembering giving any consent for it. That would be exactly the same for this whole genome sequencing. It would still be a heel prick test. It would just be a more detailed test from it. So I think it is really important to think about that consent issue at that time when, the, when you've just had a... I'd want to sort of shift a bit. There's, I mean, I think that is really important, but I'd also want to say, well, I think we place a, too much emphasis on, I don't, think I don't mean to say that consent is not important, but I think we, we expect, in a way, we've come to the position where we expect consent to do all our ethical work for us. So my question would be, a one, another way of, question, of asking a question, we'd say, assuming that people are not going to understand everything that happens to them, I mean, even if we try our best to make sure that they do understand, what other kind of protections need to be in place to make sure that they're not harmed or discriminated against, etc. So, so the consent does a lot of the work, but there's other things, there are other things we can do that mean that even if people aren't fully perfectly informed in their decisions, they're nonetheless not going to find themselves in a really difficult situation. So I think we need to think around consent as well as thinking about it's consent. It's a big responsibility for parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Or potential parents. Yeah, um, yeah. This is an interesting one. What about conditions where the age of onset is difficult to predict from genetic information, like spinal muscular atrophy? So there are several forms of, of, of SMA. You know, a, 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 a one that appears in neonatal life and the children are very floppy. Um, it's, it's really pretty lethal. And then there's another one that appears when the child is about two or three. Is that right, Annika? Yeah, there's lots of them, actually. Yes. Yeah, later. And then there are some that appear yeah. at adult onset. I think that's a really good question. It's just a really good highlight that we sometimes think, now that we've got the technology to look at a whole genome, that that will then speak for itself. We'll still need interpretation of that and, and really careful looking at that as to where has that been inherited? Has somebody else got features of it? Has it... You know, all, all those sort of contextual information needs to go along with it. And of course, the other thing that you have to say is that even if you have, for instance, a, a BRCA gene, which we know is very highly correlated with breast cancer, actually four out of, um, sorry, one out of five women who have the BRCA gene will not have... Probably more. Probably more, will not have uh, breast, breast cancer. cancer. in their lifetime, yeah. and, and indeed, there are other things that... Uh, we might say that people will have, but actually there's something else in their genome which means that they will never have it. And before we leave this particular one, I, somebody's made a good point here about um, uh, the, uh, the issue of um, bonding. So if you know right from the outset that your child has a condition, well, like Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, where they're going to die at a very early age, does that mean that you 
would f might find it difficult to bond with your baby. Is that an issue, Annika? Well, I think that's what the case history was getting at, wasn't it? That she felt she, was it Sally, wanted more time with, you know, to bond with her baby before she knew that this terrible thing was going to happen to mm, her. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that's really important. The, the loss of innocence of finding mm. out is hard. And I think lots of parents would want to have those sorts of <coughs> first carefree, innocent years before they found out. Mm. Right. Um, so we're going to go on to our um, second case now. <laughs> so we're so well prepared here. Right, you all ready online? Um, OK, so new parents Ashley and Joe were keen to have whole genome sequencing for their baby. After the birth of their baby girl, Maeve, you can hear that I've been watching sex education, um, WGS revealed that the baby has cystic fibrosis. However, she shows the baby uh, none of the features of the condition and all the other tests that you might do, so sweat tests, for example, are normal. So CF is one of the conditions that it's really complicated to diagnose from genetics alone. This is because as you'll remember from your school biology, uh, that uh, genes come in pairs. And for CF, the crucial bit is knowing what the sequence of the letters in both genes are. And there are about 20 well understood cystic fibrosis variants. But how they result in disease often depends on the surrounding genetic code and in a way that can't be predicted yet. So in the past, a CF diagnosis was usually made in children who had symptoms of CF. Then, f looking for the genetic variants was a, a good confirmation that they really did have that uh, condition. However, if you start off by looking at the genetic code in a healthy baby, you'll end up diagnosing between 50 and 80 babies a year with something termed CFSPID. Annika, help. Uh, CF screen positive inconclusive diagnosis, really because it's here in front of me. That's babies who don't have CF. So what's interesting in that our recent public consultation, um, the initial reactions of respondents was that, well, a few false positives doesn't really matter. But by the end of the consultation, the opinion was that we should stick with the more specific screening for CF that we currently have. So um, what do you think? Better to over-diagnose and make sure we don't miss any cases or keep the over-diagnosis to a minimum? Annika. Well, I think it is really interesting that that considered decision changed, didn't it? So, they, so they, I mean, it would be interesting to do the poll. Yes. And then, except I don't think we're polling for this, but, but it'd be interesting to see what people think on first impressions and then discuss it and see what they think after that. Because in this public consultation, that's exactly what happened. People thought, well, more is good. So the more diagnosis we make, the better. We won't miss any, and it doesn't really matter about the false positives. But then after talking about it and listening to the sort of patient group perspectives, the, the opinion changed completely to saying, well, actually, that's not a good thing to over-diagnose CF and, and have all that anxiety and worry about testing and follow-ups and things like that, um, only to find that the majority of those through whole genome sequencing are actually false positives. OK, what do you think? I would look at you with the yellow, with the yellow skirt. What do you think? Sorry, I was looking at that. I didn't hear the last thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, you always pick on the wrong person. So what do you think about that? What do you think? Um, do you think it's, if you over-diagnose, does it matter? In my opinion, I think it's better to over-diagnose. I mean, you can follow up with more tests and exclude the worst thing. But if it's more of a false negative, you will miss out. So it, it missed the point of doing all these tests when the child is born. So and I think the point was there were many more false positives than false negatives. So actually you didn't really pick, increase the pickup rate very much. And the ones that you did miss would come pretty soon afterwards because they develop signs or symptoms. So it was the anxiety and the worry and the NHS follow-up that you were due to all the false positives. That was the issue. OK, anybody disagree with that? Yes, yeah, yeah, sorry. I can, sorry, I can't see you through the pillar. <laughs> I 
I think that's such a good, such an important point that I think we need to get much better at. This is Oxford. They all make important points <laughs> in Oxford. <laughs> and, but I also think that we find it harder to do that when it comes to a genetic code because we expect that to be binary or certain in some way. And we might not think we do, but if you listen to the sort of discourse we have about genomics, I think that's very prevalent. But I think that's absolutely important. If we could get better at saying this whole genome sequence doesn't actually say anything very certain at all, you'll need some other test to, to confirm it. That would be much better, wouldn't it? But do you think, Sarah, that that's because since the first draft of the Human uh, uh, Genome Project in, back in 2000, 2001, um, there have been 765 episodes of CSI? <laughs> And, you know, we, we, I, I, it's, I'm not making a trivial point here, actually, because when you watch CSI, you think that there's a single spit on the windscreen and a bit of purple light in the lab, and you can tell all sorts of things about the perpetrator. Yeah. Um, that actually, even now, you couldn't tell, let alone back then in 2000. But I think that's so interesting because that is about how people are, that it's about their genetic makeup and it's about how people are related to each other, which is 100% genetic. But how diseases appear isn't 100% genetic. Yes, I think that's the difference. Mm. That the genetics we know about is much more deterministic and mm. binary, mm. but actually in health, it's actually very Much grey lesser, and yeah. actually probably becoming more grey mm. than it's, rather than less grey. I mean that, that's really interesting and, it's, and it, so one one reading of this I mean I think the normal principles of screening should apply here I and mean, I do think you should be slightly more inclusive than exclusive so I think I mean I sort of agree with you I think but you want you want some false positives but they should be minimized I think that's where I would be with it but but in terms of so we there are many there are currently situations where genetic understanding a genetic result as you said sort of requires you to understand the family history and a whole range of other things this is obviously naive science but I'm assuming that's because we're not yet in a position where we can tell you know tell things from the gene or from the biology that mm -hmm. and we have these are kind of proxies for things that are maybe one day in the future we'll be able to see from tests oh you see I don't think we will I think we misunderstand our genomes if we think that they will be able to predict things that clearly. Not apart genomes from, exactly, but more, I mean yeah. more right. And I, I see what you're saying, but I think that the context in which it arises will remain important. And we, we um, sometimes think that we can invert that. So we can start with signs and symptoms, do a genetic test, confirm those signs and symptoms. And we think we can invert that to start with a genetic test and predict the signs and symptoms. But in all but the rarest of diseases, mm. I don't think we can. And, this so that's the big question, isn't it, that we're turning it on its head. We've historically used genetics to, as a confirmation or as an underlying reason for things, and now we're going to the genetics first. Mm -hmm. And actually what we realise is, is that that doesn't necessarily answer the that question a, that we So that top that question. That is a kind of scientific yes. question that seems important, which yeah. is, you know, so let's say, you know, you've got someone and their, their breast cancer result says, you know, they're between 40 and 80 percent of having chance of having breast cancer or something. And you look at their family history and you say it's more or less 70, it's around 70 or 80 percent. Yeah. Because is that something which, you know, is there something about families or is there something that you're essentially getting out through that family history that is essentially biological? I suppose is the question. So well, somebody's, I'm going to interrupt sorry. you with sorry, a question yeah, here from fault, the audience because we, we, we could just chat here, but we're answering your <laughs> questions. <laughs> so um, there's a question here. Has anyone looked at the effects uh, of knowing a bad diagnosis, the effects of knowing a bad diagnosis early based on genetics versus knowing something is wrong and fighting to be taken seriously and getting a diagnosis later when it presents Sarah discuss because <laughs> this is so common in I your world. I think this is exactly the conundrum is that for many patients they know that there's a problem or an issue and they spend a lot of time having to fight to get referrals and to get to the diagnosis and so particularly in rare diseases um, you know we often quote these this idea of the diagnostic odyssey that they've taken a long time to be a taken seriously that there's something wrong and b to get the necessary testing and of course we want to remove the diagnostic odyssey um, so theoretically this sort of screening would remove that but are we actually taking not just removing the diagnostic odyssey but like in increasing, increasing it, it because we're introducing something else and I think that's 
the big question. Well, and in answer to the question, I don't think that study has yeah. been done because it's, it, it's referring to slightly different conditions, but I think it would be so interesting to do. Yeah, because. yeah. <laughs> Ah, now somebody says um, if parents uh, find out the info where, if, if parents find out where to find out the information located in their genome, would it be illegal for an abortion to take place? So this is absolutely categorically not antenatal. This is for once babies have been have this been debate. Born. Yes. yes, but it's a really important question. Yes because it's absolutely what parents are going to ask for when they can easily test their child's genome when it's still in the womb. So I think it's, it's so a in really other words, in other words, if you discover it in a baby that's been born, then immediately you will look for it in yeah. a subsequent okay. pregnancy. No, I, well, I think that, well, or even before that, I think the technology is so advanced that you can easily look at your child's genome or, or certainly sort of bits of it in pregnancy and I think it is a really important question what's yes. the difference between looking at it in pregnancy yes. and looking at it in um, at birth there's a very big uncertainty question here though isn't it mm. that you know once your child is born you know a problem that you might need to look out for mm. but it's a problem that might never appear so you might be aborting a perfectly yes. healthy baby or a baby with absolutely minimal symptoms Absolutely. It's a really, I mean, at, at the end of the day, if you're having a test to decide whether to carry on with a pregnancy or not, that's a very binary decision about something that's rather murky. Yes. And that's, you can't do that when the child's born. You, you know, you the child think, is here. Yes. I think this is a really important. So this, this relates to the consent question in some ways, I think. So we tend, we, there are sometimes people use arguments of uncertainty and, you know, not, 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 um, know what the implications things of saying that people shouldn't have choice or that the choice should be limited in some way a service shouldn't be provided but the whole point of respect for autonomy or respect for choice is that people in the in the people is that people in the real world which is uncertain and open-ended and complicated should have their choices respected so you know I don't it's I mean that's not to say any of the things we've said are, are, are wrong or anything but I think it's really important we don't jump from uncertainty thinking to thinking that choices shouldn't be made available to people um, now, there's a, there's a scientist out there who said, and I'm going to ask you meanly, I'm going to ask you this, Annika, would there be a place for modelling the proteome translated or mRNA transcribed from the genome in association with genetic testing at birth? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, there would be a place for it, <laughs> but it just, there's, there's more uncertainty that comes from that. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I think, think... she's saying no. No, right. I'm not. I think, <laughs> I, I think that... Um, the fuller the picture, and in some, I mean, I wouldn't limit it to the proteome, I would limit it to, to looking at other factors as well, because I think the worry is that if we just look at our genetic code, we're slipping into that determinism, and actually lots of diseases are predicted by something more than the genetic code, so in that the, sense I would agree. So the big message here is genes are not your whole story. Yeah. Yeah. There are a mass of other things that are influencing how your genes actually work and it may be all sorts of stuff in the rest of your genome that you have no idea at the time you're doing the sequencing whether they have any effect or not on what's being looked for. I'm guessing I know who asked that question I'm saying hello. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know it's you scientists at home you're just trying to trip them up aren't you? But, the, but there's two things I mean just the same thing in a way just to put a different because I do think that's absolutely right there's a whole load of complexity out there and, is, and it's really important that we and you know the, the public patients etc um, are best helped and supported to make these decisions and think carefully about these things um, but nonetheless if a piece of genetic information conveyed you know as accurately as it was a, real, was a result of test means that someone wants to make a particular choice that they you know about their pregnancy for example it should be up to them to make that choice yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, absolutely, it should absolutely be up to them, but I'm saying it's more difficult when you've only got a binary option yeah, no, to, to, to decide what to do when the information you've got is rather murky. Yeah, and I wasn't disagreeing yeah. with you, but... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, they're no, never very good about saying yes or no in ethics, <laughs> I find. <laughs> so, let's, can we go on to our third case? Yep. Yeah. Marvellous. Okay, <laughs> folks at home, listen up. So, Chris and Anna are delighted to learn that uh, mm -hmm. newborn screening has revealed no apparent genetic conditions in their baby boy. But 
they're intrigued to know what else might be in store for their son. Is he at increased risk of cancer or diabetes or mental health problems? What's his chance of being autistic? What sort of IQ might he have? The parents both know that all these things are not just about the genetic code and are heavily influenced by a wide range of other factors, diet, exercise, exposure to pollution, smoking, but they'd still like to know about heightened or reduced risks so that they can focus on his upbringing accordingly. They're both scientists. Kale Supreze. <laughs> um, they asked the NHS for a download of his whole genome sequencing data so that they can study this as he grows up. And they'd also like to send the data to a couple of new companies in the US that promise they will analyse genomic data in greater depth than the NHS does. So, what do you lot think about that? Madam. So that's exactly the kind of thing I think that I would want to do when I first uh, was thinking about it. Um, I should say, if, in case the audience can't hear this, that she says she's a molecular cell biologist <laughs> and that she would want yeah. to do that. Um, so, so in my lab, actually, we study um, the, these murky bits of your DNA which don't code for genes but do regulate gene expression and how that might lead to disease. And so, yeah, I can confirm that there's a lot we don't know still um, or a lot that we'd like to know. Um, but yeah, as to this particular case study, my initial thoughts are like, on the one hand, you know, it is the personal information about their child, and as that child's guardian, they do have a right to that information. But at the same time, that child is obviously not consenting to their parents, for example, sending this information to a company. Um, and... I don't know. My gut feeling is just focus on the things that you do know and can control. Like, okay, like so uh, I don't know how much that was uh, we caught of that uh, for the people at home, but basically, if I can summarise your argument, is probably this lady, even though she is a top scientist mm -hmm. and could look and understand at all the sequencing data, uh, she would probably only want to know that some, the things that something could be done about now. Yeah. Okay. That's to um, go back to our earlier point, actually. Mm. Yes. Mm. Things you can. Do you can do about. so actionable conditions. Yeah. Um, hello, you in the blue trousers. What do you think? Yeah, I think absolutely the same. I'm in the field as well, and I think it's just crazy to know all this information and not be able to, to do anything about it. I would know what I, I can do. I mean, mutations that can affect my child, and I can treat. For sure, not like uh, cancer gene risks or anything like this, because yeah, environment has a big role, and still we don't know how much this this affects. Okay, so that's somebody else uh, agreeing that they wouldn't want to know more than that. Anybody disagree? Would they want to know the whole thing? All oh, right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. As long as you take it with a big pinch of salt. <laughs> I think I'll have a genome with salt on the side. <laughs> he wants but to take it with a pinch interest, of salt. For yeah. interest, yes. But knowing full well that you can't, you can't gather any sort of meaningful information yet. Hmm. You know, maybe 50, 100 years' time when we've done it to millions of people, then we'll understand what your genetic code at birth will sort of translate into. I also think there's a big issue with choosing on behalf of someone who's no longer, not an adult yet, mm. and then will become an adult if you sort of not sell their data, but give their data to a public company, then when they become 18 and they decide to rescind that, or... Yeah, that's, so that's really, <laughs> that's really, really, important. really, yeah. really good point. So, so it's for the child to decide where the data, um, but after they reach the age of majority, 16, or is it, we're talking Gillick competence here? Depends what you're talking yeah. about. Let's say 16. For Let's the say sake 16. Of so they can ask for their data back, but what if they don't know? I mean, imagine there's. Where are the scientists? You've sent it everywhere. You have all these friends in uh, the Silicon Valley. You've sent it everywhere. 
and your poor child has no idea where you've sent it. And a lot of the information that's coming back from some of these companies is actually very conflicting. I think there's a question though, about facts and about principle, isn't there? Mm. So I think, mm. you know, so that there are a whole range of reasons given the way this is described and the uncertainties we know about for saying this is a bad idea. But that, that's not, that doesn't necessarily answer. So let's say, you know, at least one of these things could be answered with a greater degree of certainty that you could have some, it doesn't have to even be very profound, some useful information that relates in some way to your child re rearing practices. Okay, let's just say that, you know, to keep it sufficiently vague. But you could be confident in that information. Are, are you in principle against the, the, you know, are people in principle against the idea of generating information for parents and then having access to that? Or are you against it primarily because of these factual questions of uncertainties? Because I, I think I could, I'm not a parent, I don't plan to have any children or anything, but I could imagine a situation in but which... But you've got a dog. I've got a dog. <laughs> so, okay, so yeah, so my, you know, there are two types of dogs. There are dogs that like long walks and there are dogs like lying by the fire, say, for example. And I just, and I happen to know from the genome that my dog likes lying by the fire, <laughs> is that type of dog then I might want to just do a bit more of encouraging them to lie by the fire, you know, say. So, you know, there might be these broad, there might be, um, the, key, the key question is, are you in principle against the idea that parents might do any kind of test which helps, based on their child's biology, which helps their parenting, or not? I mean, or seems... how about reversing it the other way, that the child discovers that really his IQ was absolutely enormous, but his parents ignored him. Exactly. The whole of his that early life, and <laughs> he's had a really unhappy. <laughs> he never got into university. So he's never. I mean, I think you ask a really important question, Mike. What is it that we're in principle against? But can can we think about? I think parents finding out what their children might benefit from during the childhood phases is one thing, but parents finding out what might happen to them as adults to me feels quite different yeah. and we've never been in a position to do that before we've you know we might as parents influence the type of school that our child goes to or um you know the, the what friends they make we might influence all sorts of things that alter the course of their life but should we be looking into a, a lens that suggests what's going to happen to them after they stop being children and we're responsible. Well, I can think of well, some situations. I mean, I say I have no skin in the game, as it were, so I don't know. But, I, um, but I, I could imagine a situation where if there was something I could do, I mean, there are things we could do, but imagine there was something sort of genetically, as it were, sort of biologically, yeah. that I could do to provide a more secure mental health foundation for my childhood and their later so, life. So, for example, I would, a, I a very good example of that might be um, whether you're likely to develop psychosis um, with uh, cannabis use, mm -hmm. which has a, you know, quite a, a, a distinct inherited element. I don't think I'd be able to, I mean, not having any children, but knowing enough, I don't think I'd be able to stop my children smoking dope. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, so we've got some great, great questions coming in. Thank you to all of you online. You're doing a great job with the questions. Um, so um, this is a question from a scientist. And Annika, you're going to have to explain it first. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good question. Um, if DNA methylation changes as you age, would the data gathered have an expiry date? So DNA mm -hmm. methylation, it's like kind of, think of it like post-it notes on your genome. You're explaining it very well. Well, right. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> so post-it notes on your genome that instead of saying, make it as normal, or that say, don't make it as normal, or I'll have only half of it, or 10 times it, or whatever. So, OK. Yeah, they're post-it notes that cover things up or not, and they, they affect how genes express themselves. So I think the question is hinting at the fact that your genetic code doesn't tell you everything because there are influences on that code that um, affect the expression re regardless of the variation in that code. Yeah, and, and the sequencing doesn't tell you anything no, about the variation. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so it's the, I think it's a really important point that highlights what we were saying earlier about the, the, the gene sequence doesn't tell you all you think it does because there's lots of other things that change over time. And so I think, again, that thing of looking at things at birth, we do it because we want to detect childhood onset conditions. But in, if we're doing it through whole genome sequencing, there is a, that, that the interpretation of that changes over time. So 
methylation is one example of it, but there'll be other things where we just in, we, we change our interpretation of the variance as someone gets older. So we do need to ask the question of why we're we doing whole genome sequencing at birth. If it's only to detect uh, childhood onset conditions, then I suggest we don't need to do whole genome sequencing. We can do that much more effectively via other routes. So we like, do need to ask the question. Like other routes, like? Well, the current um, tandem mass spectrometry, the technique. For the heel prick, but that's only a very limited range of conditions, isn't it? Well, it's only interpreted for a limited range of conditions. It's perfectly possible to expand that and interpret it for more. But the only reason it's interpreted for nine is because they're carefully selected as ones that you can do something about. But that really you could also, just to yeah. answer your question, you could also do whole exome sequencing, which is a lot, much, much less of the genetic code, and that would pick up the vast majority of those 200, But I'm going to throw it to you, Sarah, because <laughs> um, one of the big issues for people with rare disease is that there are very strict criteria for screening. And actually, rare disease, people with very, very rare diseases get the fluffy end of the lollipop because there's not enough of them to make it um, financially worthwhile in the way that it would be for other conditions. Yeah, and I think that's the thing we haven't really talked about is that the, be the benefit, but also the limitation of whole genome sequencing is you don't have to have any idea of what you're looking for when you do it, it picks up things you're not looking for. So for rare diseases, it picks up, you don't need your doctor to know about the rare disease to look for it. It will just come up. And of course, that's a huge advantage. I think what Annika's arguing for is a middle ground and um, where we don't look for everything, but we look perhaps for a bit more. And I think perhaps all of us might want- Or potentially it. a stage. I mean, one or a stage, that, a yeah. Stage you do that and then you, but I think the economics, I mean, this is a point we were talking about earlier. I yeah. think you, know, you could imagine a situation where, rightly or wrongly, we, get, we move into a world where a whole genome sequence is very cheap and these other kinds of tests are more important, are more, sorry, more important, more expensive. And so you, then there's a kind of health economics thing. Should you buy something cheap yeah. uh, because then you've got money to do other things, even if it produces more information that you don't want and causes you other kinds of problems? I think that's a kind of... And there is this question that once you know it's there and it's possible, that people want it. Mm. Mm. And yeah, there is that. Okay, so I'm going to ask, <laughs> <I'm gonna laughs> ask our scientist here. I'm going to ask our scientist here because there's a, a lot of uh, also questions coming in from the uh, online audience. Um, what about if you could in some way prevent the parents knowing about conditions? In other words, they wouldn't have access to anything about their child that appeared in later life? Yeah, so, I mean, something I've been thinking about while we've been talking, is like this would be a phenomenal educational and research resource, right? So like, you wouldn't even have to tell parents anything at all, and we would learn so much and benefit so much as a society from this. Um, but then that also leads me to think, like, why are we actually doing this? Is it really to diagnose conditions? Is it to be a learning resource for us? Or could we spend all this money you know, in a much wiser way from, say, for example, uh, screening a much smaller panel of disease and loci? Or even, like, if back to our discussion before, we were talking about using it to uh, maximize your child's development, we could invest all that money in free school meals and you will yep. benefit the development of far more children than, yeah. you know, I think that's, that's so important, isn't it? It's also about being completely honest about why we're doing this. Are we doing this just to diagnose conditions? Or are we doing it to set up a resource that we want to learn from, we want to research? And, uh, and that, that adds a whole different layer to it. And actually, the diagnosis is only the first point. Mm. Like, what do you do with all of those people that then have those diagnoses? Like, there's a lot more money involved in looking after them, supporting them. But on the other hand, a lot of those people could otherwise have been going on diagnostic odysseys, which we know are extraordinarily uh, expensive. expensive. Yes, but they'll be balanced by the people who are over-diagnosed and they're going on a diagnostic odyssey that is not needed. So that's the problem, isn't it? I mean, in, in ethics, you know, we tend mm. to think of ethics as kind of, you know, people have different views, but obviously there's a huge amount of factual there's a whole lot of evidence that we need to get on these kind of things. And that is actually quite important because 
as you kind of said, you know, a lot of the evidence about, for example, some of it's going to be um, economic, about the kind of, but some of it's going to be about, well, how do we interpret this stuff? How are we going to generate that unless we generate, unless we create huge data, databases full of millions of people's data? So, you know, if we don't go down that route, then we don't learn those things, yeah. presumably. And if we make the argument that actually whole genome sequencing is now so cheap, we do need to also look at the associated costs of them. So, so it, the actual sequencing might be quite cheap, but the storage of the data might be quite expensive. So yeah. we need to do the whole thing and together. And after it, mm. you've got to look off, you've got to store it, but you've yeah. got to store curate it, securely it, yeah. curate yeah. it, okay. analyze it. So somebody online, excellent question here. Would the proposed sequencing data ever become available to other public bodies other than the NHS, like the police to use? Mm. And uh, what he, this person then mentions is the case of California and the Golden Gate Killer. So uh, for anyone who doesn't know this, this was uh, the Golden Gate Killer was a serial murderer in San Francisco, Golden Gate Killer, and uh, the crimes were unsolved. And the police decided, th there was a, a partial match, I think, and the police then decided to look at the data that had been gathered by Ancestry.com, which is one of these, um, you know, discover your ancestry things for $25. And members of his family, his distant family, had actually done that. And they were able to track back and find the Golden Gate Killer, who, had, who was not part of that database, by reference to the data from his uh, brother, was it? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, you're not going to prevent that by a new, an NHS newborn screening program because that's all completely reliant on people spitting into a pot and sending it off to Ancestry.com or 23andMe. So I think it's a really important question, but it's totally uh, peripheral to this one because Golden Gate Killer was not detected through police tracking an NHS or a, pub or a healthcare database. It was through what people themselves had volunteered to um, submit to companies. It does raise... It does raise a question, though, which is to do with um, what needs to be the case for people, but patients or not patients, depending on whatever the initiative is, to have sufficient trust and confidence, re well founded trust and confidence in, in this. So, what kind of protections need to be placed in place? Some of them will be, you know, who gets access to the data, obviously, and that might be government agencies or it might be commercial companies or of certain types or it might be you know and we need we do need to have that kind of conversation because none of this will succeed you know in this in this other sense in the to be honest I don't think it'll I don't think it's going to succeed clinically or scientifically unless people are willing to put their data into this yeah. mm. so that, so this kind this kind of thing there might be some people who say that was a good thing obviously but there'll be some people I who know say we did that, have yeah. when we did some uh, work with the public we did have one gentleman who was absolutely convinced that the HMRC, so the tax man, yeah. was going to look at DNA. I don't know what he thought the tax man might find in his DNA. <laughs> his but tax code, possibly. Another, yes. It raises another issue that I think we have sort of skirted around, is that actually looking at the DNA of your child tells you something about the DNA of you and yes. your other members of the family. And I think maybe, Viv, you're going to take us there a bit later. But uh, I think that's an important thing to remember. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, what about this other bit, which is, you can imagine that if this was, if this happened, you would get lots of companies springing up, who would then go along and say to parents, "Well, the NHS only looked for these things, but we can." look and for all these additional things are going to be totally trivial like you know does your baby like avocados you know should you uh, or you know have they are they likely to have what i'm, I'm yeah. just saying well, i was kind of i was i was thinking about a trivial thing that there are trivial things but there's also that the more trivial they are the less likely they are going to be predicted from your genetic code so it's yes. two things together. so cilantro are or they? something you know am i will i like coriander Yes. And I mean, I wouldn't, I don't have an objection um, to my parents knowing whether I was going to like coriander, but I just don't think that's going to be predicted from my genetic code at birth. 
in any shape or form. I mean, you know, it might be that it's you know one percent more likely, but it, that's just not something that. But the um, companies that do those kind of tests make an awful lot of claims. Yes, but that's going back to your point earlier about we just need to have a better conversation about that. And we need to not let those companies exist and avoid where we're not having that conversation, where, you know, the knowledge is power and find out about your genes, uh, headlines that those companies already employ, sits in a context that's a bit more realistic. Well, this is where it's really important to think about um, the distinction between, I think, you know, between a public health system and other stuff that's provided. And it, this is a kind of in the area where, uh, you know, trading standards, deception, mm. You know, these sorts of things are really important. I think it's very important that we have, impo you know, we have powerful legislation with teeth that makes people sure that people don't claim things that are not, you know, that are not kind of, you know, based in, based in any kind of evidence. I don't mind people buying trivial things, to be honest, but I do mind them being deceived yes. and talked out of their money when, when it's pointless. Yes. Uh, one, one further question. Uh, which has come in from our online audience. Thank you very much, online audience. Um, don't, and it's, this is for uh, Mike. Don't most scientific studies not report their results back to the families as they aren't genetic counsellors? UK Biobank. There's been a really, I mean, this is actually, this is why this debate's so timely, because there's been a big shift over the last how many years? I can't remember when UK Biobank was founded, but let's say 20 years, just to make up a, you know, when UK Biobank was established, it was very much the case that research studies in general pays, it was very important ethically to, to make a clear distinction between research and clinical practice. So we didn't want patients, we didn't part, want participants to mistakenly believe that they were getting treatment when in fact they were in a research study, let's say a cohort or something. So there was a lot of emphasis on the importance of keeping a really clear distinction between research and clinical practice. That actually disadvantaged, it, it was, there were good reasons for it, but disadvantaged lots of groups, for example, people with rare, dis rare disorders. And over time that's changed. So then we had things like the DDD project, Deciphering Developmental Disorders Project, which considered that, and there was questions about, well, you know, what do we feed back on? And that tended again to sort of go slightly forward, well, let's not feed back too much. But now I think we're in a world where to be honest, if you set up a big data set on pub using public money and you ask people to participate and you said, we're not going to feed back anything, it will be judged as being kind of inadequate in some way. So, there's a qu so I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just talking about the, the culture, as it were, the zeitgeist. So I think there is now an expectation that some kind of feedback will happen in these big initiatives. And, and I think that's a worry because I think actually if we look at the history of UK Biobank and we what the first um, sort of genome screening that UK Biobank did was SNP arrays of of all the participants SNP arrays, explain is, SNP arrays. is looking at variants throughout the genome rather than sequencing or looking at particular variants and it's that's a technique that's really good at picking up common variants but actually it's really bad at calling rare variants but that, that wasn't generally known at first and so what would have happened if that had been fed back to people a whole lot of people would have got a say a BRCA1 or a BRCA2 variant that actually would have been something like 95 percent likely to be wrong to be a false positive so that could have caused a huge amount of harm so actually i think uk biobank did a really good call there mm. of not feeding that back and we don't know what the next bit is going to be whether there's going to be false positives and false negatives i, I, bet I sort of agree and disagree with you in a way so I <laughs> there's think, a surprise well no <laughs> the, which bit's the surprise <laughs> <laughs> the um so i think it's uh so I was, on, I was an author on a UK Biobank paper which, which looked at imaging, feedback from imaging, and showed that, I, th I can't remember the numbers exactly, but something like for every, for every couple of people that you would identify through this, you know, looking at their imaging and then mm -hmm. referring them for, as an incidental finding, for every couple of people that that would benefit, something like 190 people would have to go to their, through yeah, a process yeah, of being yeah. assessed. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, that was a, that was a, that was, if you read, you, one way of reading that is we should never do feedback. But another way of thinking about it is to say, well, we should be very careful about feedback. Mm. And I, I just, mm. so, you know, m most of my work is in low income settings, low in Africa and, and Southeast Asia. So in the context of a global health research project, for example, where there are very, in a situation where there may be very poor access to healthcare, I think it's perfectly reasonable to expect a research project to do some feedback. I mean, not about things that are meaningless, but yeah. about things that are meaningful. Yeah. So I think a lot depends on, I, I do think there's a, it's a risk, particularly also where we're integrating healthcare and research. I think there's a, it's incumbent upon the people who design and fund those things and carry them out to think carefully about what their responsibilities are to the people who take part. That's not to say we should feedback loads of stuff, but I do think 
feeding that something under certain circumstances is the right thing I, to do. I agree. People go into it because they want the feedback. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. some people do that. Okay, right. yes. Okay, so um, are you ready for the next case? <laughs> So they're all enthusiastic <laughs> here um, in Oxford. So what we're going to turn to now is the idea of the baby's genome being a life course resource. And we're also going to look at whether it might all, what the genome might also reveal about the parents and their risks of developing certain conditions. Now the plan is at the moment that the genomes from the newborn screening program will be stored in the National Genomic Research Library and they'll be available for researchers to use both to further knowledge and to develop new treatments and diagnostics. Some of the researchers will come from commercial health companies such as biotech and pharma who develop most of the medicines in this country. So what, let's have a poll, um, what do you all feel about that? Um, uh, particularly about commercial health companies. Are you happy about this arrangement or not? Okay. So yes, no, please. or don't know. Okay. Yes, no, don't know. So how are we all doing? Are you happy? 53% yeah. no, some people are still voting. So that's interesting, just a sh tad over a half of you would be happy about it. 30% definitely not. Who voted no and why not? Who voted no and why not? I'm not, this is not to put you on the spot. Yeah, I voted for mainly because of what constitutes commercial health companies and my inherent distrust of the data practices as a whole. Um, they do not have my interest at heart. But what if the value is returned to you? As in, let's say that your data is in there because you have a rare disease which currently has no treatment, but actually because your data is in there, a treatment is developed for the, the rare disease that you have, not necessarily for you because these things take a long time to research and to then... Uh, you know, get onto the market and all those things, but it will help other people with your rare disease in the future. Hand up, uh, hand up in the back. So is the worry about disproportionate profit rather than profit in, it, in itself? So if a company has spent an extraordinary amount of money taking an idea and then developing into a, a drug, which is not a trivial process and takes a huge amount of expertise, and uh, the trials themselves are extremely expensive, so we don't mind them recovering the costs and a bit, but what we do mind is a disproportionate profit. In other words, they're making squillions and... Or rolling out a drug that's unaffordable to the health yes. service. Yeah. Exactly. So is that, yeah. is, that that, is, is that the sentiment? should be 
funding it more publicly and being transparent about um, about the, the kind of profits that come out of it. Okay. It's quite interesting. I sort of feel like I've been on a bit of a journey in relation to. Uh, so I think I think profit is one thing, but I think there's something else which is more important, probably which it, well not more important, but as important, which is the trust, public trust in the whole thing, the health services. Also, you know, I've always been really strongly committed to a public, publicly funded health system with kind of minimal, you know, private involvement, and I, I still am largely, but I do think that progress in medicine and healthcare does involve increasingly i mean it looks like it needs to involve technology partners to put you know, at the very least so there's going to be some need for an effective health system to have some kind of relationship with commercial companies and i think it's really really important that that is managed extremely carefully so that because, it's transparent well so that it so that we can benefit from it in a fair in a fair way and i think it only takes you know the misuse of data Inappropriate profit is, 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 is one factor, but I think, you know, things being used for the wrong kind of thing by the wrong kind of people without which, things which they hadn't, you know, which were beyond what the agreement, the initial agreement was for, I think those can come at a huge cost, which is the opportunity cost of all the benefits that could be gained from a healthy ethical partnership between commercial company, technology companies and the health system. And I think, you know, we've seen from, you know, Google DeepMind and the Royal Free and others that, you know, there is a real danger there, I think. Yeah, sorry. Hello. Well, there seems to be a concern about sort of profit that is not sort of necessarily deserved in a sense, but uh, another concern seems to be about privacy and identifiability. Um, you know, so perhaps we could think about ways in which that data could be shared by and, and minimise sort of identifiability. In some way. So just to, to, to say that all the um, data that's held by Genomics Inc. Well, Genomics England is the guardian of the National Genomic Research Library. And all that data is de-identified. So all the things that might identify somebody have been taken away. Although, if it's a very rare disease, the chances are that you could identify that person. But I, I've often uh, had people with rare disease say to me that, Actually, people know they've got a disease, a, 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 a condition, the minute they walk out the door, and they're not actually worried about that at all. They're more concerned that there's research done into their well, I think condition. The data is particularly important in rare diseases because they're rare, so you need to gather a lot of data. But also, the data in general is worth a lot more if it's linked to clinical information. Mm. So if your resource of, of your whole genome sequence you're going to be able to understand that much more if you know what happens to that child as they get older. And the more information you link to it, the less de-identified it becomes again. It might not have the name and address on it, but the more, the, the richer the information mm -hmm. tied to it, the, the more you can... The more valuable it is. The more valuable it is, but the more also you, you can't really genuinely say nobody could identify them from it. But One it's, of the things that's a value, I think, that's good, I mean, it's potentially a good thing, is the idea of what's called trusted research environments. So mm. Genomics England was one of the first of those, which is the idea that so a, a good, most, most his, historically research projects, when they've shared data, which is a good thing, they've shipped it, basically they've sent it on a hard drive or something like that. Whereas now, m most of the new initiatives are such that the data is in a particular place and you come and you do research on that data in an environment where you can be audited, your practices can be audited. It's really hugely expensive, so, but I think it may be the so future. So to put it in another, in another way, so commercial companies pay a fee just in the same way that if you went to the London Aquarium to see the fish, you'd pay a fee to get in, because after all, somebody has to pay for the fish to have fish vets and fish food and those little castles to swim through. But, it, no. but... <laughs> And you could look at the fish through the glass, but what you couldn't do is take a fish away with you. And that's the same kind of principle. Sorry, reduced, <laughs> reduced to Jack and Ori here. Right, we're going to have our last case now, quickly, quickly. Because um, you've all got to go home and have homes to go to, probably. Um, so, uh, Abby is a single mum. She consents to whole genome sequencing. But when the results come back, she's told that her baby has familial hypercholesteremia. So we'll call it FH from now on. But that basically means it results in high blood levels of cholesterol, 
and this usually bring, uh, begins in adolescence. And if it goes undetected, it can result in fatal heart attacks and strokes, usually at a very young age. So FH's impact can be prevented by regular monitoring and by the use of drugs called statins from a young age. Typically, FH is only picked up by GP testing, but many people fall through the net and it's thought that about 240,000 people in the UK are undiagnosed. Now, because Abby's baby has a genetic tendency to FH, it's possible that other members of her family also have it, and it's suggested that they should also all be tested. Abby agrees to have a test herself, but she's estranged from the rest of the family, and the one cousin that she is close to says she'll be told she's a troublemaker and not to say anything. This is family weddings all over again, isn't it? Um, she has no involvement with her baby's father or his family. So, this is, this is where things get really complicated. Annika, um, the point, and we've made it several times, is you're not just sequencing the baby's genome. In effect, you're also sequencing the families. Can you explain? Yeah, I wouldn't quite agree with that. You're not, in effect, sequencing the families, but you're finding other people who, who, have, who, who might share that same finding. So you're, fi you're fi finding a group of people who you think may be at risk and therefore may have an interest in knowing this finding in the baby, and yet they're not your patient or you don't necessarily know how to find them. But but it's, so the, the tension there is how you, um, how and when you alert family members to a risk that you've identified in one person when that family isn't doing it themselves. And I think that's a real sort of classic genetic problem that, um, so, you know, Mike and I have run a, a, a forum where we talk about ethical issues um, over the last 20 or so years, and that one just crops up repeatedly, it's probably about 50% of all the cases, isn't it, of familial disclosure. So I think it is a really important question, particularly so in this day and age where it's usually one patient, one health professional, and, uh, and that's the focus and not the family around it. And family situations, I mean, I was saying about family weddings, but you know that the family situations are always tricky, aren't they? Um, what would you do? Yes, I'm looking About at you. What? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What's the question? Uh, so, what, so um, how about getting all the rest of the family involved? What do you think about that? And you were always a troublemaker. <laughs> it's, we, we hear that a lot from people where they've gone to actually other members of the family and they've actually had the door slammed in their faces. And, you know, you, 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 you know we always knew you were a bad lot. <laughs> but can we, can we learn some lessons from the COVID app and find ways to communicate risk of genetic information in the same way that we've found ways of communicating risk of infectious diseases, is my question. So can, can, you, not, can you say someone in your family yeah, has been diagnosed yeah. with FH without disclosing who it is? Yeah. There's some cases, some situations in which that's possible. Okay. But, um, um, because it's a big responsibility for, the, for, for Abby, it's a massive responsibility. She's found out that there's her child's got a condition and now not only she got to deal with this condition in her child she's now tasked with this responsibility of knowing it for her family it's it's, it's, it's also quite an interesting from a totally different point of view but it, it says that the baby has familial hypercholesterolemia the baby has a genetic tendency to that the baby doesn't actually have it yet I, uh, familial hypercholesterolemia very rarely actually results in high cholesterol levels in a baby. So I think that's again but an interesting But they might do in an adolescent. Yeah, well, absolutely, and, but many years from now. Yeah. So it's a good example of how we conflate the two. We say they've got a genetic tendency, or therefore they have it. They don't have it yet. They've got a tendency towards it. One of the things that, I mean, I've, this, just go back to the previous, I think, mm. that's, I think that's really important, but go back to the previous, I mean, I've, Annika and I have written a lot of, a lot of papers and thought a lot over the last, you know, for a mm. long time about this question about how you think about families in the context of 
genetics all the, you know I you know when you when you I got interested in clinical genetics partly because of this question about relationships and how you think about them in kind of ethical ways and you know you don't need to watch kind of EastEnders or anything more because the most because it, the, you, the more, the, the, the really interesting prob ethical problems in genetics, in, in clinical genetics, are to do with complicated families and complicated, the relationships we have as people, you know. And, and, and so the, the, the question is, you know, is really what, how should we think about the responsibilities of doctors when they're working in a way which is clearly familial? You know, most areas of medicine we think um, the patient in front of you is the person who matters whatever they say, whatever, you know, except with exceptions like, you know, in fact, some and certain kinds of infectious diseases, we say what's, what's, what's said in the room is stays in the room kind of thing. But in, that, in this kind of situation, that doesn't work. It feels, we feel, I think, intuitively that there are some responsibilities to the family. So the question is, what's the nature of those responsibilities? How far should they go? And we've always argued, I think, that medicine needs to be changed to be more familial than it has been historically. And I think there has been a bit of a change, but so people what if there was that. a what if there was a, uh, so we, what if you were talking about BRCA rather than about um, FH? So, so we've agreed that we don't want to tell parents um, about late onset conditions for their child, but do we have a responsibility to tell the mother of a newborn baby that she might be at risk of breast cancer when actually, you know, having its mother healthy and well is really important to that baby and uh, other children in the family. Sarah. <laughs> well, I think, I, we, I mean, we, BRCA is a good one because we already have current practice for this. And so we don't generally look for BRCA in a child. But when BRCA is found, there is this idea of offering testing to other family members. And, and not, I think notifying people of their risk. So if your child has a BRCA gene change, you're probably, at each parent, at a risk of having passed it on. So I think, I think we do have a responsibility to tell them that. I, think that. I think it's a nice way to try and break it down into steps, isn't it? Yeah. So I think to say, BRCA mutation in the child, therefore mum needs to be told she's got high risk of breast cancer. That's too many steps conflated into one. You might want to take a family history of cancer. You might want but to... But lots of people she, have who have... She might have... The have baby BRCA but have, uh, have no family history. Well, then you might also want to modify your risk information because if you're detecting BRCA in, someone, in a family that, where BRCA is present and there is no family history, there are clearly modifying factors around that mean that... But they BRCA might have all died early from being run over by bus. Yes, but that's where you need good clinical skills to take a detailed family history and find those things out. Now, if someone's been adopted, you can't do that, obviously. But, 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 but the same, what's her name? The baby? Abby. Uh, Abby. So Abby's baby might have inherited the BRCA mutation from the father. It may be that Abby's mum doesn't, you know, it's, or it may be de novo. Who, well, maybe not that. You know, I don't know. Right, you but can see what, and what, what knots they tie themselves into. Um, there's an absolutely top question um, that's come in from you are on fire at home at the moment. Um, is there a point at which if you sequenced a certain percentage of the population that you've sequenced everyone statistically, yes, mm. even those who haven't consented? Yes, yes. yeah. That is a percentage, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What's the question? Sorry. Well, it, uh, I what think. What percentage would you need to sequence to have a sequenced everybody? Everyone. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, the, and the percentage can't be a hundred percent. But it is. But there is an interesting that the number of people who've been sequenced by some of the, you know, twenty-three me and mm. Uh, mm. is it actually going back to? Those uh, that those records means that actually about sixty percent of the population have actually been sequenced. In effect, well, of people of Northern European, of history. Northern European, absolutely. And I think yes. that's a really important point. Yes. That I, the more we sequence, the more we look at genetic information, the more skewed those databases get. And so we do need to think really carefully about gathering that information out people from people who aren't of Northern European ancestry. But I, you can impute lots of things, and I think there's lots of headlines, aren't there, about how people find out um, by doing those sorts of tests that, that
their father isn't who they thought they were and actually they're a product of a you know a secret liaison or something like that uh, um, uh, and they find lots of half siblings but I think that's slightly different again because that again is about how we are related to each other and that's pretty and that's where DNA is pretty accurate that doesn't necessarily help us very much in the prediction of many diseases. Well, I suppose there's also another way of looking at the same problem would be to look at how big are the studies that people are try currently trying to establish. Mm -hmm. You know, so mm -hmm. you know, the, in the UK, that our future health is going to try to get five million people. You, lots of studies around the world that suggests that you need something really big to get near anything useful. So, Sarah, there are an awful lot of people who are undiagnosed with rare disease. So I, before I ask you our final poll, I wanted to ask you because you know so many people who are directly affected by rare disease. What are your thoughts on whole genome sequencing for screening of birth? <laughs> this is the big question, isn't it? I mean, I think that the discussion we've had has really highlighted that there's, it's such a complicated issue. And I think, I don't think there is an easy answer. I think whole genome sequencing for far more people so that they get diagnosis for rare diseases is really fantastic and reducing the diagnostic odyssey for those would be um, great. But I'm also conscious that actually diagnosing a lot of other people, over-diagnosing or misdiagnosing a lot of other people has its own inherent problems as well. So I haven't really answered the question. Okay, but so we are going to do our final poll now which is, to go back to our very first question, is would, and I'm making you all pregnant again, would you have whole genome sequencing for newborn screening at birth? Yes, no, or don't know? Bib, can you remind us of the figures at the beginning? Oh, that was like 70, was quite high. 73, was like 70 percent, I think, yeah, right? It was about 73, yeah. yeah. OK. Oh, so some of you have changed your mind. Not many. But not many. Yeah. But not many. At least it hasn't gone up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Um, That's really interesting, isn't it? It's, it? I hope that you've found this interesting. No, yes, they're, they're nodding. They're oh. nodding here. <laughs> if you're at home, I hope you're all nodding like kind of nodding dogs at home as well. Um, and uh, Do I we know how many people took part in the polls, roughly? 25 of them, but between 50 and 70. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so I want to thank our splendid panel, uh, Sarah Wynn, Mike Parker, Annika Lucasen. Um, they have provided us with extraordinary food for thought. They've not been the least bit helpful about <laughs> binary answers, <laughs> but that is their very nature. And... Um, <laughs> For that, actually, we're extremely grateful because it's hugely important to have people discuss these things. And I just want to let you know before we finish is that um, this idea of whole genome uh, sequencing for newborn screening is not something that is going to be rushed in any way. It's something that is going to be uh, take a long time lots of discussions with all those people who might be affected, not just parents, but also the impact on workforce, for instance, on midwives who already have an extraordinary load, what it means for genetic cancers. So this is not going to be something that is going to be announced by the Prime Minister and rushed in by Tuesday tea time. This is something that is going to be thought about for a very long time, uh, properly consulted all the various people involved. And then uh, there will be a pilot and if it works, it might get introduced into the NHS. If it doesn't work, then How it will won't. we know if it works, then? <laughs> I don't know what the criteria will be, but they will need to be set. Wait till next year's Being Human Festival and we'll yes. be yes. Yes. Wait yes. they're 30 years old. And uh, yeah. So on that note, would you please thank, in the usual way, the panel. Thank you very much for turning out on a cold, wet night. Um, it's been really appreciated. And um, to you at home, thank you for listening. Um, we've really appreciated having you with us. And uh, it's been splendid. Thank you. Thank you, Fib. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.